Welcome to the At The Coalface podcast with your host, Jason Greenwood. This podcast is all about what it's really like in the trenches of digital and e-commerce. Mr. Nick Hensley, welcome to the pod, my friend. Thanks, Jace. It's great to um, be a part of it. Thanks for the invite. Oh, you're very welcome, man. You're very welcome. We've uh, we've known each other. I think it's been for just over a year now, and it's been a really exciting time for our industry. You know, over the last eighteen months or so, it's gone a little bit crazy with the whole ecom thing, uh, and you are smack in the middle of it over at Lexer. That's for sure. And I wanted to get you on the podcast because you're so knowledgeable about customer, customer experience, customer data, customer tech, uh, martech, ad tech, you know, whatever label you want to put on it. Everything you do is focused on the customer and customer data and customer experience and how we can all collectively as an industry, as an omni-channel industry, how can we get better at using the data that we have about our customers to give them a better overall experience, not just to market to them better, but actually genuinely serve them better. Uh, And I felt that that was a totally appropriate topic given everything that's happening in the industry with COVID uh, and demand skyrocketing for e-commerce, plus given a whole lot of the privacy moves happening in the marketplace, death of third-party cookies, and a whole lot of other things that have kind of come to a head and are continuing to come to a head I felt like you are the perfect man for the job to get on this podcast. And I'd, I'd love, uh, you know, I just respect everything you guys are doing over at Lexer and, and you personally. And I'd just love to hear maybe that 30 second elevator pitch about how you came to be in the industry, how you came to be at Lexer and, and, and what you're all about and what Lexer's all about. It's just, uh, I'd love to hear, hear that. Excellent. Um, thanks for all the kind words, mate. Um, and, yeah, it has been a year uh, and it was probably six months of me following uh, your content on LinkedIn before, yeah, I reached out to you. So, um, yeah, I really value what you're putting out there but also the relationship that we have. Uh, I guess how I came to be in the industry um, really quickly, uh, I, I did work on the floor in sales environments um, across two menswear businesses when I was um, at university uh, and then found myself in above the line media sales um, for over 14 years uh, and really enjoyed that time there but uh, it was really interesting you know, you'd have clients spending you know, over two hundred thousand dollars on a four week uh, campaign uh, and you'd ask how was the performance of that campaign and so often whether it be direct or um, with an agency um, the response was we didn't actually know um, and I've always been really passionate about uh, not only data but also digital as an enabler um, so I got my opportunity to start in a, a really early stage tech startup um, I was there for a year and then um, I started at Lexa four years ago um, now uh, and as far as Lexa goes, um, as you mentioned, Jace, we're a customer data platform, um, software organisation, uh, and really quickly uh, we help organisations better understand and engage with their customers um, better at a really high level. Spectacular. Uh, welcome. Uh, you know, it's, it's a, it, you know, definitely the big welcome, Matt, is, is out for you and and. I think I really truly believe that the the audience is going to get a tremendous amount out of this because of your deep experience in this space. Uh, and you know, how's you, you guys are obviously you're based in Melbourne, um, and Lexer is based in Australia, well, founded in Australia, so it is an Australian company. But you have gone global now. You've obviously got clients all around the world now. You're back in lock. You're based in Melbourne. You're back. You're back in lockdown in Melbourne. How has COVID, from a high level, I guess, affected you personally? Uh, you know, you being in lockdown for a very long period of time in Victoria versus, say, other parts of Australia. How has that impacted you personally, and how has that impacted Lexer as a broader Australia-based business? How have you know? How have you seen maybe you know versus now versus the start of of, of COVID hitting and lockdown starting? How has that impacted Lexer's business and how has it impacted you personally? Yeah. Um, so I guess to start, Lexer is a Melbourne-founded um, and 
continues to be a Melbourne developed organisation. Um, but as you mentioned, um, we do now have global footprint um, and we dropped in the States four years ago. Um, and it's been really interesting, um, really the last 15 months or so to see particularly the two regions, uh, how it's in impacted, but also developed um, during that period. Uh, I guess, you know, it was a sign of how we performed um, during the period, but also in the lead up um, when we announced our Series B earlier this year, um, led by Blackbird Ventures, a lead Australian venture capital firm. Um, but as far as uh, how it's impacted me personally, um, look, it's been, there's been significant change working from home, homeschooling, um, all of that compounding uh, and us continuing to be busy throughout the period. Um, but I think as well, I'm really fortunate to be part of an organisation where we were certainly set up uh, to easily work from home, um, but also you know, continue culture um, and support of each other throughout that period. Uh, and it's it's been an exciting time for us as well. I think in October last year, we had 45 people as part of the business um, across the two regions. Um, and as of this week, we've got uh, We've onboarded our 82nd um, Lexi as part of the organisation as well. So uh, even in that short period of time, you know, eight months, um, we've doub nearly doubled in headcount as well, which has been really exciting for the business as well. That is, that's just an awesome outcome, really, you know, given the, the nature of the industry and how challenging it has been for a lot of people. Um, that, that's, that's an amazing result. Um, I've watched the growth from afar. And it's been absolutely incredible to watch. And, and I think the other thing that really excites me about Lexer, when I look at how you guys evangelize in the market around your own product, you really have found a way. I don't know how you guys do it, or maybe it's in your contract when when new Lexi sign up. But but they, re, you know, almost everybody in the business that I that I see, they're hyperactive on LinkedIn. They're talking about customer. They're talking about the customer journey. Sure, they're talking about Lexer and what it can do and how it can enhance that journey. <clears throat> but they seem, you know, passionately evangelical about the business. And you've got to, you know, even down to your data wranglers. And I love that term that you give to the people that engage with your customers uh, in terms of trying to fit, you know, wrangle their data because it can come from many different silos, many different channels. And you guys really are that central hub of the customer experience data. You know, you, you're not a CRM and you're not a marketing automation platform, but you fit squarely in the middle of those two platforms and you plug a gap that neither of those platforms fill in the marketplace. But, you know, it, it really, maybe you can speak to, I guess, the passion of the team because there must be some amazing leadership in place because it's almost like guerrilla marketing. You know, almost every single day that I open, in fact, every single day that I open up LinkedIn, there is a post from at, at least you and, and usually I'll see five or six posts from other Lexis as well. And that's, that's a powerful marketing tool when your team is that passionate about what you guys are doing. So maybe you can speak a little bit to that and, and how you've kind of structured, I guess, your, your leadership because it's uniquely Australian. Um, the way you go to market is uniquely Australian. The, the messages that you send are uniquely Australian. It's, it's pretty cool, man. And as someone who's obviously in the ANZ region and been here for a very long time it's it's a pretty awesome thing to see actually because it's it's very it's distinctly non-american let's put it that way <laughs> um again thanks for the kind words and the compliment um for everybody as part of the organization um there's certainly nothing contained in a contract um when you sign we don't have any gamification within the organization of uh, how many posts you post, engagements, all of that type of thing. Uh, it, it's interesting. There is there's movements of uh, instead of user generated content, employee generated content, um, which you may have seen. Um, but I think at the end, and you you touched on it, uh, we're genuinely passionate about the problems that we solve for organisations, uh, and I also think. In talking to businesses, and it comes back to what I spoke of earlier, um, is that in the first instance, that true understanding of the customer. Um, so when you ask questions about 
how many active customers do you have? How many have you acquired? How many have you churned? How many are part of your loyalty program? Do you have a loyalty program? And, and typically, a high proportion of answers are we don't know. Um, and then obviously, there's a whole lot of um, elements to unpack about that. Uh, so I think we're really passionate about helping organisations uh, understand their customers in the first instance um, to better engage with them and then obviously have a better bottom line. Yeah, I mean, I guess that, you know, Lexer's not a, not a cheap platform. I wouldn't say it's the most expensive in the market, but it's not a cheap platform like any good piece of technology that you'd want to bring into your business as part of your full-blown commerce stack. Uh, you know, none of that stuff is cheap if you want to do it right. But I think the value that you bring to the table, and I've had, you know, I've obviously had demos of, of the Lexer product, and it is it is the most impressive CDP I've ever I've ever seen, and it does things in a very unique way. Uh, but I tell you, what's interesting that I'm seeing in the marketplace, even independent of of anything going on at Lexer, is a couple of things. One is the industry's been very good to the CDP space over the last eighteen to twenty four months, in the sense that. You know, Google and, and Apple are almost your best friends at the moment. You know, Google's killing off third-party cookies and making it all but impossible to, uh, to, to, to track attribution and to, you know, and to, to do lots of the other things and, and segment and, and do lots of the other things that MarTech uh, and ad tech have relied on, uh, you know, for the last 15 years, really, from a, from a cookie perspective. Uh, and, you know, with Google, uh, Apple's privacy moves with iOS 14 and then, and then the recently announced iOS 15 and the clamping down on, on email pixels and bringing new privacy levels to not only the apps uh, that are installed on, on iOS devices, but also clamping down on the entire uh, email ecosystem now as well. Uh, you know, it's the, the walls are closing in on brands as I see it. And, when we look at, at what brands are trying to do today and, you know, we still have so many brands out there that are batching and blasting emails and sending them out with no segmentation, care or love for the customer. Uh, you know, we've got we've got all sorts of things happening in the marketplace. But as I said, Google and Apple have to be about your best friends right about now, uh, combined with, you know, we're seeing massive consolidation in the customer experience space and CDP space. Uh, you know, there's been massive CDP acquisitions over the last 18 months. All the majors seem to be buying up MarTech, ad tech, CDP, marketing automation platforms left, right and center to try to compete with standalone products like Alexa. Um, you know, can you speak to us a little bit, I guess, the, about the changing landscape of privacy and how Lexer and, you know, obviously just CDPs in general fit into that landscape and how they bring value to brands, but more importantly to the customer in a landscape of totally clamped down privacy and death of third party cookies? Um, there's a fair bit there to cover, um, mate. Uh, first of all, yes, there's been significant. Uh, acquisition of CDP uh, and that's mainly from the um, uh, Optimizely uh, or AP server. Um, so there's there's a lot of activity going on um, there uh, and that's really happened only in the last year to 15 months. Um, but as far as yeah, the privacy elements across uh, Apple and Google in the first instance, and I saw the, the latest update of what's pending in iOS 15 um, coming around email marketing um, and privacy elements there. Again, I think it comes down to um, understanding the customer um, and that obviously a big part of that is the data component um, and having true single view of customer, uh, understanding your first party data, um, then it's educating your your resource to not only interpret that but also use that um, to optimize in channels like Facebook, Google, um, across you know Apple assets as well. Um, so that's how we, in the first instance, help organisations uh, in data analytics, um, but easy workflows and into the right channel. Perfect. That's um, you know that fills fills a very big gap. Now, what I'm going to do, just uh, if we want to change gears just a little bit here, what I'll do is I'm going to describe to you 
uh, what I think a CDP is and does in an organization or what it should do in an organization. And you can basically poke holes in that or tell me how Lexer might do it differently to other CDPs in the market or how, you know, I guess some of the things that a merchant might want to look for in a CDP. Again, you know, I, I don't believe in, in making this an advertisement for Lexer because that's not how I roll. But but obviously we want to try to make this information as accessible uh, and, and beneficial to as broad of an audience as possible. So if I just riff a little bit here on a CDP and where it fits into the, the e-commerce or commerce full stop tech stack and, and sort of CX tech stack, uh, I'll let you poke some holes in that and, and we can go from there. How does that sound? Sounds great. Cool. So obviously we've got CRM, which is an operational, you know, part of the stack. We've got marketing automation, which is a clearly marketing focused part of the stack. Uh, and CRM is, is operational in the sense that, you know, when people send in emails, it tends to go in the CRM. When they make phone calls, it creates a case in the CRM. When someone needs to make a return to a business, they, they typically will reach out through either social or email or phone. Uh, and that's operational and that gets loaded as a case into a CRM. So basically, when we talk about all the operational functions of a business as it relates to customer facing comms, that's typically managed by a CRM. Uh, and that's kind of where a CRM tends to begin and end for a retailer, whether they're B2B, D2C, B2C, doesn't really matter. That's the typical use case for a CRM. And in that sense, businesses that run a CRM think that they have a single view of the customer because the CRM typically also has information around, you know, how many purchases they've made. It, it, it knows about each and every individual purchase. It knows the products that they bought, when they bought them, the order ID numbers. It's got, you know, an operational you know, it's, it's part of the operational core of a business in terms of how a business serves the customer. But it's not typically, uh, unless there's been some customization in place or unless it's integrated with another system like a CDP, most CRMs are not designed to be marketing platforms. They are fairly and squarely focused on ops. Now, if we look at the other end of the spectrum, we've got marketing automation platforms, which are fairly and squarely focused on marketing. And they typically focus marketing automation platforms like your Clavios of the world, your dot digitals, your Emarcy's, et cetera. They all focus on marketing and mostly they focus on email marketing. So they're connected, you know, in the first instance in an omni-channel business, they get connected to an e-commerce website so that subscribers automatically sync to, to, the, to the marketing platform. Uh, all the sales go through to that marketing platform, at least the web sales do unless they're also integrated to other operational uh, platforms so that it knows about all those other sales and contacts across other channels. Uh, and then it's also got a catalog feed as a rule. And so that marketing automation platform starts to gather data around subscriber and customer interactions with the business, but that's typically only across the web channel. Again, unless they've got a, a broader based customer, you know, integration across all their channels into the marketing automation platform. And th to be fair, those marketing automation platforms usually have at least some form of rudimentary RFM, so recency, frequency, monetary value scoring against customers, propensity to churn, and, and they can do basic segmentation based on how long they've been a customer, what they've bought, uh, you know, whether they're a male or female, and some of that zero or first party data that tends to come through the website channel particularly. So just so that everybody knows, zero and first party data, zero party data is typically referred to as information that the customer gives you willingly about their profile, i.e. I am a male, i.e. I was born on the state, i.e. these are the things I like. These are the foods I like, these are the colors I like, these are the sizes I wear, etc. that we explicitly give to a merchant to help them give us a better experience. First party, uh, first party uh, data, on the other hand, is, is data that we know about the customer that they didn't explicitly give to us, i.e. we know what they've purchased from us, we know what pages they visited, we know what categories they visited, we know what they've added to a cart, we know what they've added to a wish list, we know other things that we can infer about their engagement with us, and marketing automation platforms will typically know at least some of that zero and first party data as long as it's integrated with those platforms. But really, they are focused on being able to build a campaign, build a basic segment and get the campaign out the door and making sure that that cam campaign is going to be deliverable to the various inboxes and email systems out there. And then th th those systems tend to provide the email or marketing analytics around, okay, did that, did that message actually get delivered? Did the customer interact with the message? Did they open the email? Did they click on it? Um, you know, if, if they did, did they purchase anything on the backside of that, et cetera, et cetera. So, 
we've got marketing automation on the one hand that does these these limited aspects of segmentation and RFM scoring and maybe some CLVs, uh, you know, calculations, propensity to churn, etc. We got CRM, which is very operationally focused, and then we have this massive, gigantic quarry gap in the middle, which CDP fills so elegantly, which is, you know the ability to do multiple ways of doing RFM scoring, the, the multiple models of doing churn propensity, multiple models of how to do your CLV calculations. It's got, uh, it's got the ability to connect to third-party data sources outside of your organization to validate and cleanse your data. It can connect to your marketing automation platform and it can push those segments into the marketing automation platform, which is, which is a much better informed segment and a much more holistic segmentation than what typically exists in the marketing automation platform. Then we can bring in the cost to serve costs for those customers from the operational systems into the CDP. So we know not only what the customer is, what value they have to us in terms of the revenue that they generate by channel, but we also know how much they cost us to serve them. So we can start segmenting based on not only revenue that they drive by channel, but also cost to serve by channel. And we can dedupe, for example, most CDPs have the ability to deduplicate uh, duplicate accounts where one person creates more than one account using more than one email address so that we can cleanse that and we have a true single view of the customer, unlike a CRM, which doesn't know that and can't detect those duplicates of, of accounts. Um, so. From my perspective, a CDP slots right into that gap that is naturally created between an operational platform and a marketing platform. Do I understand that reasonably correctly and accurately? Yes. Yeah. Um, and I think you've articulated it really well. Uh, and if you look at uh, the CDP Institute, um, as well as Boston Consulting Group, um, around this time last year released, you know, there's four critical functions of a CDP uh, and we can go into each of them, um, but fundamentally it's ingestion and data transformation, it's unification, uh, creating a true single view of customer, uh, it's intelligence and decision making, uh, and then it's activation. Um, so I think when you're summarising what a CDP does, it's uh, critically all of those four components. Great, yeah, that, that makes that makes complete sense. And I think that that's gonna help some people out there that have wondered, hey, well, I've already got a CRM, or maybe I don't. I've already got a marketing automation platform, or maybe I don't. Um, so why or why would I, wouldn't I want a CDP? Now, when you go in and when you're consulting to businesses and when your team is consulting to businesses and they've called you in and they've said, hey, what's Lex all about? How often when you go in, do they have an existing CRM or, you know, as a percentage, roughly high level finger in the air, how often do they even have a CRM? How often do they even have an omni-channel customer service platform like a Gorgeous or a Zendesk already? How often do they have a marketing automation platform in place already? And how often do they think when you first start talking to them that these platforms already do everything that Lexer does until you enlighten them? How often, you know, what is the typical type of engagement that you go into? What is the level of knowledge that you usually find and encounter on the customer side when, or the merchant side when you're going in and talk to them, talking to them about CDPs? Uh, um, so as far as CRM goes, obviously the term is really ambiguous um, now uh, and often, the question is, like, what is a, a CRM and, and how does it function within an organisation? And that's probably for another topic. Um, but lots of organisations that we work with, but also across the industry, lots don't have a CRM. Um, as far as service goes, vast majority will have, uh, as you mentioned, Gorgeous is doing a really good job in this market now and obviously in the States. Uh, Zendesk's been here for a long time. We have our own uh, capability, um, but then there's lots of others um, from a service aspect. And then everybody has an ESP or uh, a better version um, in a marketing automation platform perspective. Uh, it's questionable whether they're using like the full capabilities, um, utilising that tool. Um, but as far as do they have a CDP, lots of the market still don't. Uh, and it's it 
certainly is a, an education um, still at this stage, um, but interest and demand of a CDP has certainly increased in, um, significantly in the last uh, 12 to 15 months, um, particularly on the back of COVID. Yeah, and, and I mean, I guess, you know, when it comes to uh, a CDP, you know, a lot of the brands, I guess, that, that I have spoken to, they don't necessarily see the advantage of a CDP if, the, if as of today, they're a, a, a mono-channel business. So let's say they're a pure play online business, right? They may not necessarily see the value of a CDP today. And, uh, you know, it may, maybe help us understand a little bit more. And I've got my own feelings and thoughts on this, but I'd love to hear your take on how, you know, single channel businesses that may or may not be selling on, you know, so they're, they're, let's just let's just take the pure play example. And they're, they're selling through the website, but they're not selling on social. They're not selling, you know, on a marketplace. They're not selling through a bricks and mortar estate. They, they really truly are a pure play e-commerce website based business. How in that type of environment does Alexa help a brand like that connect more deeply and intimately with their customers and create a better customer experience, which ultimately leads to better stickiness and more effective marketing spend, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, and I'd always start with, uh, again, how well they understand or know their customer, um, you know, who is newly acquired. Uh, and so often, I think the stat is 70% of people who transact will, will never transact again. So first time buyers, who's active, uh, there's been significant increase in loyalty programs, um, particularly in the last 12 months. So many just focus on uh, active, loyal, loyal customers. Um, and then who's lapsed? And then that fundamentally uh, sets up you know, the critical objectives of acquisition, growth, and retention. Uh, so we'll go through that um, in the first instance. Um, and then that will help in conjunction with marketing automation um, through flows or customer journeys, um, but particularly efforts um, for that type of business that you refer to in growth uh, and doing that in optimised ways across you know, paid channels particularly. Yeah, because I, I mean, as I understand it, you guys are feeding out. So, so you, you gather all this data, you normalize it, you transform it, you you um, dedupe it, uh, you uh, you amend it with, for example, mosaic data. Maybe you can speak a little bit to that and and how you how you cleanse data by connecting or how you augment customer data by adding in some of the mosaic data, the QAS uh, information, etc. Maybe you can speak a little bit to that, but more importantly, on the the, on the other side of that, when you send the data out to something like a, a Klaviyo or a marketing automation platform or other operational platforms or marketing platforms, you guys really become the single source of truth for segmentation. So all the segments, all the, the data modeling, all of the, uh, I guess, all of the rules and and everything that, that would create those dynamic segments so that, you know, a marketer doesn't have to run those segments every so often, you know, the, the platform's going to do that automatically. And then those segments are going to dynamically, as customers fall in and out of those segments, uh, based on their behaviors, whether that be purchasing behavior or any other behavior that they take that you're tracking, then at that point, that dynamic segment is going to be pushed into something like a Klaviyo, where at that point, Klaviyo knows what to do with that particular segment that's been dynamically updated. So it's going to trigger off a workflow, say, for example, and it's maybe it's an onboarding workflow or maybe it's a maybe it's a. Uh, maybe it's a STEM workflow, or maybe it's a whatever it might be. Maybe it's a maybe it's a brand workflow because they've you know they've 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 reached a certain milestone of engagement with your brand so far, and now we want to put them into a brand uh, workflow, a brand education workflow to create that more deeper emotional connection. But maybe you can talk about some of the systems, I guess, that Lexer pulls on to augment customer data and enhance it with more information that allows the brand to treat them better and to treat them as more of a unique human being than just uh just because obviously the holy grail in marketing is to get to a one-to-one -one level of segmentation where uh, where each customer is a segment of one and i feel like a cdp is one of the tools in the tool chest that allows merchants to get closer to that holy grail yes yeah, so 
if we start with that ingestion and data transformation piece, um, so marketing automation wasn't and hasn't been built for crunching large volumes of data persistently and automatically. Uh, and there's, there's great evidence of that um, from an acquisition perspective from a, a CDP uh, case. Um, and that's at our core, uh, again, referring back to CDP Institute and the BCG piece, that's what at our core what we do. Um, so, and you referenced a couple of the sources earlier, but we're transforming data from email, CRM, data warehouse, maybe an ERP, you know, loyalty management systems now, uh, web. Uh, we also, as you mentioned, have third-party data, licensing agreements with the likes of Experian. So we're doing all of that transformation, not only in the first instance, but persistently and automatically. Uh, and we're creating a true single view of customer, uh, utilising multiple different unique identifiers, not just an email address or a um, unique customer ID, as an example. As far as the segmentation goes, again, um, once configured, um, and there is some um, intelligence and decision-making that can go with it, once configured, all of those segments automatically and persistently update based on all of the data events that are happening at those various different sources that I um, referred to earlier. And then uh, once chosen the channel, so whether that be, you know, you've mentioned Klaviyo or any marketing automation platform, uh, any social, so Facebook uh, extension into Instagram, Google, uh, retargeting, uh, and now even on site, uh, we, we do have the one-to-one -one capability. So whether that be a unique discount code um, that's going to um, an individual, whether that be an email or on site, uh, we do have the capability to feed that into the various different channels. Uh, and um, further to that, there's, you know, our capability um, and some across the market also have it is the ability to update a custom audience, whether it be in Facebook or uh, in Google, multiple times a day. So in Facebook's case, they'll take custom audience updates uh, as a maximum twice a day. So we'll, um, if set, um, always on, we'll update those segments or audiences twice a day in those channels as well. So uh, I think the critical piece um, from the outset is that data transformation capability and um, the multiple different unique identifiers to create that single view. Uh, and one example of that where all retailers have that issue uh, is lots when you go to their website are inducing first purchase with a discount um, so provide us your email address and we'll give you 10% off. Um, and lots will use multiple email addresses to get that discount on multiple transactions. And then, of course, you'll have potentially three versions of the same person in your database. Um, now, that foundationally will affect your RFMs, um, but also on-site personalization if you're using historic data. Um, so the flow and effect from that first engagement is significant um, when you're trying to drive better engagement and personalization ultimately. And I guess even when there's nothing sinister at play, you know, customers may create a, an account from their work email address, their home email address, and a family email address, but they're the same human being. So whether they're sort of trying to game the system and, and get, get some extra loyalty or get a, an extra credit or get an extra abandoned cart discount or, you know, or whether they just genuinely have more than one account in the system that the system doesn't recognize, there's massive flow on effects from that across all of your data. So CLV data for one is going to be, you know, customer lifetime value data is going to be way out of whack because if, unless you can recognize that these are all the same human being, you're going to think that the CLV, for example, might be really low, but when you aggregate it across all their active accounts, the CLV might actually be quite high, but, but their cost to service may be quite high and their average margin by channel might be quite low as well because I guess that's the beauty of a really good CDP 
um, you know, I would put Lexa in the bucket of a really good CDP, is that because you're taking data in from your operational systems, you know, for example, that, you know, not all customers are created equal. So let's say, I don't know, let's say that, that two customers have a $5,000 CLV and they've got a $100 AOV, uh, average order value. Um, but, you know, one, one contacts your customer service team on average three times per purchase, whereas the other person contacts your customer service team 0.5 uh, times per purchase on average, well, then we know, uh, obviously, the value to the business of one customer versus the other, right? Whereas if you only look at top line revenue um, that that customer generates across your business, then you won't be looking at those other things that, that will help quantify the actual net value of that customer to the business. Or if you've got a customer, for example, that shops across your omni-channel business and you know 50% of their purchases are in store, 50% of their purchases are online, but when they're in store, they spend you know 70% more per order in store than they do online because of the fact that they're engaging with a salesperson and the salesperson is effectively cross-selling or upselling them. Um, you would never know that unless you're using a CDP that will help tell you that and gathering the right data from the right places. Or let's say they shop across two of your physical retail stores and online and one of the physical retail stores that they shop at, um, they spend 70% more on average than they do at the other physical store. And now you can start drawing some inferences that the salespeople in the store that's, that's able to, to sell them more, there's something about their process in that store or that individual salesperson that's that's outperforming the others and how can we level up the others to be as good as them? So is it a matter of retraining the other store that's underperforming? So there's, there's many, many operational impacts of the data that comes out of a CDP that isn't just about marketing to the customer. It's about how do we serve them better across all channels and also how do we incentivize them to to go to the channels where they clearly like engaging with us the most because they they clearly through their actions engage with that channel more deeply they spend more money and they shop more frequently there but without a CDP you wouldn't necessarily know that uh, unless you're doing some sort of BI custom reporting out of ERP or something like that so uh, maybe you can speak a little bit to that 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 customers do not behave the same across all channels nor do they behave the same across different touch points within those channels if you've got multiple stores in your chain, for example. So maybe you can speak to that a little bit more and then and then speak to how a CDP helps a business operationally up their game in regards to how they treat their customers. Yeah, it's a really good question and um, topic in the last 15 months. Um, so if we, if we separate the two, um, as far as, uh, again, not only the basic metrics of number of active customers, how many have you acquired, how many have churned, et cetera, but customer lifetime value is typically really hard to get out of organisations um, because even if they're a pure play digital native e-com business, um, it's still complex um, and lots run uh, incorrect calculations on that. Um, so. In our case, and majority of other CDPs, um, the CLV um, is easily presentable um, and analysed. Uh, but also, we've got some more mature customers of ours that have given us their profitability scoring, um, and we're operationalising that in our platform as well. So, uh, more mature and more advanced organisations are utilising that. Uh, as far as the in-store component goes, there's lots of organisations in the last 15 months that will be reporting, um, but also treating uh, customers that have typically transacted in-store um, had to migrate to e-com as newly acquired customers um, because they've either never identified themselves in a store against the transaction or... Uh, they haven't done the true, again, unification or data transformation right at the start. Uh, so, you know, unifying offline and online, again, is typically really difficult um, and lots would be treating them as new customers. Um, so uh, there's another reason why CDPs um, are gaining great traction in the market, um, but also, you know, in conjunction with loyalty programs to help um, increase identification in store. Uh, so 
I hope that answers your question, but also using a reference um, to that, Jace, in the last 15, 15 months. If, if you have one, that would be awesome. Sure. Oh, uh, I, um, I think oh, there's there's a number of organisations that run fantastic loyalty programs um, here in Australia. They typically have you know sixty percent plus uh, identification of a transaction to a customer in store, um, and then obviously that significantly improves. Uh, not only data quality, but also capabilities to better engage with customers. Um, so uh, loyalty programs definitely help that, but also just education of sales associates in stores. So you don't have to have a great loyalty program for a sales associate to be able to uh, ask and provide value of capturing that unique identifier if it's just an email address or three or four components of data um, to append against it a transaction um, but just that tiny instance is just going to render so much fantastic um, value not only for your business but also for the customer ultimately right so re effectively what you're saying is by implementing an omni-channel loyalty program um, that effectively forces the customer to give up at least a little bit of data i.e at least their email address to unify uh their loyalty experience across all channels and as a result of that that oftentimes is the catalyst for starting to understand customers across channels and understanding that they are the same human being across those channels so i guess that's that's the key takeaway from this is that you have to give the customer a reason to give up their data particularly at point of sale in a physical store where you know they don't necessarily expect to have to give that information up but i think there's another benefit to giving up customer details and uh this is what i'm seeing so uh, uh i for example i don't like having to keep receipts right and, and i would much rather my my transactions be stored you know my physical transactions in the store be stored against my customer account so that i so that for warranty service and all the rest and knowing when transactions took place and 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 all, all the all the things that go along with knowing your transaction history with a brand, um, I want to have that stored against my account so I don't have to even worry about a physical receipt. So A, that saves paper. B, it, it makes the customer experience better because you can just walk out. Uh, and C, it gives the customer yet another reason to give up their email address for your business, which is, hey, you don't have to worry about keeping your receipt. We'll track the sale against your account. So that way, if you ever need to return it for any reason, or you need to change sizes for whatever reason, or, or it breaks or whatever, then we'll have that transaction record um, from your in-store purchases stored against your account for you. Uh, and it will, it will also allow us to personalize your experience um, further th through all of the experiences that we provide to you. So I think, I think loyalty combined with that harmonized data experience where you can, as a business and as a merchant, you can resurface that information back to the customer in meaningful ways that actually they go, wow, I really love this. And, and, I, and I just had this exact experience uh, yesterday when I had to go buy something at, 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 at an auto parts store. I'm part of their I'm part of their program. And the reason that I joined their program, 99% of it had nothing to do with their loyalty program. It was because they store all my sales in store against my account so that A, I can see them online, but B, I never have to worry about keeping a receipt. So th there's some other advantages, I guess, operationally to the customer to having this unified view. And that's really important. But more, But I think if we go one step beyond that, I think understanding the discounting purchasing behavior of a customer also becomes relevant because in the same way that we want to track cost to serve or cost to service uh, in our total um, margin calculations against a customer, we also want to track how much discounting they take advantage of with us. So for example, if a customer 80% of the time, they will only purchase something when it's on sale, on special, discounted, on promo, coupon code, something like that, then we know that they're an extremely price sensitive customer. However, obviously if a customer only ever buys from us at full price or 80 to 90% of the time they buy when a product is on full price with no discount, no coupon code, then we know they are not a price sensitive customer. So instead of doing the scattergun approach where we put you know, 50% site-wide on sale or we put this entire category on sale or we put half of our catalog on special or, or whatever, we can now do much more targeted marketing and discounting that doesn't harm our bottom line as severely 
by sending a custom coupon code to the customers that are uh, you know, either in danger of churning or haven't engaged with us recently or something like that. And we know they're price sensitive and we know they're likely to convert if we give them a coupon code for 10% off or something like that. And we email it to them and we, we drive that through segmentation. But if we don't know that information and we're not tracking that in the CDP and we're not segmenting on it, we can't do anything about it. You might maybe want to speak to that. Yeah, totally. Um, so e-receipts to start with are really interesting. Um, there's been huge adoption in the States comparable to Australia from an e-receipt perspective. I think the other the call out to that is um, you know, making sure opt-ins um, align as well, being able to utilise uh, email address for marketing purposes. Um, but I think also fundamentally uh, the exchange of data, uh, there'll be there should be a value exchange um, between the two parties and that can be in the form of an organization's purpose and content i think it's really important um, the experience that the organization is going to go give back to the customer in that exchange and then as as, as we've spoken of you know loyalty programs also help um, that not only data collect but also usage across the customer journey so i think um, purpose and content um, is critical uh, and if I sort of tie that back into your discounting element, you know, I regularly do analysis of EDMs cr across weekends. Uh, you know, I'm, I've subscribed to over 200 merchants to see what the type of experience I get is uh, and so often the email content that I'm getting across EDMs between 70 and 80 percent is discount batch and blast uh, and so few is like true uh, or components of content and purpose driven um, which usually always see better engagements and not only opens and clicks but also transactions off um, so i think yeah uh, purpose and content still continue to um, provide huge value there and then speaking specifically on discounting um, and to your point as well, you know, it's really easy in a CDP to identify discount shoppers um, and propensity to trans uh, like convert off discounts um, and then the associated segmentation with that insight um, based on that behaviour and then utilising uh, across the various different channels, paid and owned, um, I think is really important as well. Brilliant. Yep, no, that makes, that makes total sense. I think you know when you take into account the cost to serve, the propensity to convert off discount, combined with their, you know, when you when you factor those two things uh, and margin into CLV, because if you're only looking at the acquisition cost, and many brands aren't even looking at that, so I think there's there's three major components that should go into CLV that usually don't. Uh, and they should also be brought into CLV by channel because a lot of brands, they don't look at CLV by channel. They look at, at, at you know, in the worst case, they look at CLV average across all customers and all channels. Yeah. In a slightly better case, they look at CLV by customer, uh, but they rarely look at CLV by customer by channel. And, and I think that you, want, you, you only can really pull big levers in your business when you have all of this data segmented down to channel level. Because without channel level data and without channel level segmentation, you can't then drive workflows that are channel specific or you can't drive experiences that are channel specific. So I think that's a real key is, is getting all this data. And when most brands look at CLV, they just look at how much a person spent over the lifetime with their business. So from the, from the first time they purchased to today, how much have they spent with me? That's their lifetime value uh, uh, to me as a business. But if they're not taking into account the cost to serve, the propensity to buy on a discount, therefore their average average margin. Uh, and then if they're not looking at those things um, you know, by channel, they really are doing themselves a massive disservice, I believe, uh, in terms of being able to bo both give the customer the experience they expect, but also protect their margins at the same time. Do you wanna maybe speak to that just, just a little bit in terms of the, the rudimentary um, aspect of CLV calculation you typically run into when you first talk to a merchant? I think, um, and it's broad brush statement, but lots, they're, they're not doing the calculate, like any type of calculation of CLV. Um, so there's huge opportunity in the first instance to establish that. Uh, so, but I think 
the lots don't, um, and particularly uh, the like omni channel um, or traditional retailers, both bricks and mortar and e-com. Um, but I also think like it comes back to uh, when we talk about like go upstream again, foundationally, uh, that data transformation piece. Um, so if, again, if you if you're not doing that properly. Um, initially, it's really hard to do like true measurement and tracking um, against performance. Uh, so, yeah, and there's there's a really interesting movement coming out of the states around customer based corporate valuation, uh, and it talks to a lot about customer lifetime value. Um, but even, like splitting that out and doing analysis of you know new customers by year of acquisition, average discount in first order by year of acquisition, average order value by year of acquisition, average spend by year of acquisition, um, where they've come from, um, customer lifetime value by year, but also projections. So, you know, we haven't really touched on predictive models. Um, so not only things like next best product and using historic data to inform that rather than, um, you know, website behaviour, but also looking at uh, predictions of customer lifetime value, predictions of churn, those type of things are also playing big parts in customer lifetime, uh, customer uh, or corporate value, customer based corporate valuation. Um, so, but again, it's really hard to do that um, if you don't have your data foundation um, and transformation in place initially. Yeah, no, that makes complete sense. That was the third thing that I actually forgot to mention when I when I said if you're not taking into account, you know, certain things in your CLV calculation, it's definitely going to be wrong. Um, you know, I talked about cost to serve. I talked about propensity to, to purchase based on discounts. So therefore, your average margin by customer by channel. But the third one is cost of acquisition um, by customer by channel. And that's another thing that a lot of businesses, if they're doing just basic rudimentary CLV calculations, they're not looking at their cost of acquisition, particularly through paid channels, you know, Google search, you know, Facebook ads, et cetera. And that's another thing that a good CDP will do is it will bring in at the customer level and the channel level, uh, both marketing channel and sales channel, it will bring in the cost of acquisition for that customer as part of the CLV calculation. Um, so maybe you can speak just a little bit to that around uh, around CAC because, you know, a lot of customers or sort of a lot of merchants out there don't actually realize that, that, you know, they think if they acquire a customer off of, say, a Google ad, they think that that's a one-time cost of acquisition cost. Um, and and then, they, and then they might just take an average. So they'll take, okay, here's our total spend on acquisition costs across all channels. And let's deduct that from reven revenues um, ac across like our, our average CLV. Let's, let's let's split that up. And then let's let's take that out as an average cost uh, against our customer lifetime value. But, you know, I guess for you guys, you're able now to get down to a customer level cost of, cost of acquisition per purchase if there is one. Because oftentimes they'll have to reacquire uh, over and over again through a Google ad to continue to sell to a customer who's price sensitive, who's shopping online every time and starts with Google. So maybe you can speak a little bit to that because that's that's to me that's the third pillar that sits under CLV calculations that oftentimes gets oftentimes gets ignored. Yeah, definitely. So the enablement of that typically um, will always recommend that uh, we implement our JavaScript tag within uh, Google Tag Manager. Uh, agnostic of whatever tag, but um, that's one option. And by doing that um, in association with UTM tagging for all of your content across all of your channels, we can start to identify where uh, associated with every identity that in a segment or an audience, we can identify that um, a customer came from source Facebook um, hit website and then all the associated behaviour there, obviously including transactions. So we can identify, easily identify where a customer has been acquired from and then in association with all the calculations that you spoke of, of course, you know, spend and budget, etc. We can then identify, uh, help identify um, CAC by channel but also, you know, blended CAC as you mentioned as well. So I think it's important to um, talk about how we do it or how others would also do it. Um, but it's, it's increasingly important to be able to measure those type of elements, particularly 
you know, right at the start, we mentioned you know, the changes that are coming to Google, the changes that have happened with, um, with Apple and um, more so is still coming um, to be able to identify those metrics, um, but also, again, use first party data to better optimise those channels to improve CAC as well. Amazing. Amazing. Look, I, th I think this has been um, really exciting. Uh, I've really enjoyed it. Uh, we're sort of coming towards the, the end of, of the time we have together. And, and uh, you know, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed your insights, your your knowledge in this space is, is obviously because you're deep in this every single day and it's your laser focus. Uh, I've learned a lot of, 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 you know, I understand a lot about CDP because of you and thanks to you. So I, I definitely appreciate your deep experience and, and I, have, I have such a respect for you because, you know, when businesses say they want to become data driven and they want to become customer centric, those oftentimes are buzzwords, but they actually don't know where to start and they don't actually know how to do that. And I guess for, for you know, any business that's looking to become more customer centric, if they're looking for a tool set to be able to do that, then a CDP has to be right at the top of the list for consideration of how to become more customer centric and how you treat them, how you respect them, uh, but more importantly, how you make sure that you're acquiring and looking after a sustainable customer set as opposed to going out and acquiring you know, customers that aren't really your ICP, they're not your ideal customer profile and you're not continuing to nurture them and look after them. You're, you know, in some cases you actually want to churn out of your business the customers who aren't a good fit for your business and who aren't sustainable and who are always going to be shopping for a deal. Uh, and so I think a CDP like Lexer allows businesses to start moving in that direction of customer centricity in a way that without a CDP is virtually impossible. And so I think that's, that's amazing. Um, um, one final question. Have you been watching uh, Martin uh, Sorrell's uh, S4 uh, Capital and his, you know, the, the, the meteoric rise of his business since he exited WPP in, in 2018? His laser focus, I guess, as an agency uh, on customer, you know, he's been very vocal about how he believes that this transformation of the industry towards a customer focus and digital only. So uh, S4 is, is, is digital only. That's the only channels that they work across now uh, versus his old WPP days, which were mostly mostly traditional media. So it's it's been awesome to see you know, one of the oldest legends in the ad, traditional ad industry to really get religion as it comes to customer data and it, as it comes to customer analytics and customer experience. Uh, have you seen any of that stuff that he's been talking about for the last 12 months or more? And does it excite you? And does it excite you about the future of CDP of someone that old and that legendary in the industry truly is starting to appreciate the importance of customer data? Um, that, that to me bodes very, very well for your industry. Yeah, I've only seen um, a handful of uh, articles and coverage of, of what he's establishing. Um, so I can't talk specifically to it. Um, but what I will say, and it's great for the whole industry, is the focus on the customer um, and putting the customer first. Um, and it sounds like that's exactly what he's attempting to do. And um, it's it's common across most uh, large agencies that are either uh, attempting to build or building um, their own type of CDP as well, um, and even a major TV network um, here in Australia launched, Channel 7 launched their own CDP a couple of weeks ago as well. So um, I think it's fantastic not only for, for us as an industry but also as consumers um, as we, you know, expect better uh, experiences, um, again, because it's been born out of the likes of Amazon and Netflix. So I think it's a fantastic movement, um, but I'll definitely have to... Uh, read up on his efforts for S4. Brilliant, brilliant. And one final thing before we go, you heard it here first, people. With all the M&A activity over the last 18 months in the CDP space, I'm calling my shot. I'm calling Lexa to get acquired within the next 18 months for over a billy. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, I, I think that's, I think that's, I think my bet's pretty safe. Uh, 
You know, I could be wrong. We'll see. But uh, but yeah, I, I look, I, I think it's an exciting space. It's crazy what's been happening over the last 18 months in M&A activity in the CDP space. Uh, and you're a hot property. Um, the brand's a hot property. Love what you guys are doing over there at Lexer. Really thank you for being on the podcast. Super appreciate your insights and knowledge. Uh, and look, I'd love to have uh, I'd love to have a chat in another six months and see what the market is, um, uh, the market is doing around CDP at that stage because I think with the privacy moves being made by all the majors at the moment, uh, you know, uh, you know they call it privacy, but really it's about entrenching their their strongholds uh, and their walled gardens. But uh, I'd love to get you back on another six months and see what's moved in the meantime. Hey, right, thanks so much for um, the kind words, uh, the support, and the interest. Um, and, and thanks so much for the opportunity to come on. Um, I love your passion. Um, really appreciate the content that you put out there. Um, and I think you're a fantastic um, trusted advisor for our industry. So, yeah, thank you as well. Oh, my pleasure, mate. Really good to really good to be mates. And uh, look, I think we've got a bright future, all of us that are working in digital and e-commerce. Thanks for being on and um, we'll chat again soon, brother. Excellent. Thanks, Jase. Thanks. Bye. Thanks for listening to the At The Coalface podcast. If you want more At The Coalface, you can subscribe to our premium e-commerce and digital newsletter at The Coalface Digest.